Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Every part of comics and artwork is a form of communication with other people. It's not just a, here, let me direct my thoughts at you as a dictation of concept, but it's hoping to convince you of how cool you think a visual could be or a story could be. And you're trying to communicate ideas in one part storytelling and greater part just graphic impact. You're hoping to relate a sense of energy, urgency, and enthusiasm to people that there's a lightning of spirit that comes out of superheroes that has always worked for me. That it isn't really about the practicality of what they might do about, it's not the practicality about grown men punching each other in costumes. It really isn't about that. It's a visual metaphor. And that metaphor could be for a lot of things, but it's mostly just about the energy and enthusiasm that can be found in the fun of life. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for another Word Balloon Live, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here, Paul Kupperberg here, and Paul, A, it's great to see you, and B, cannot thank you enough for involving me in this incredible uh, thing we're about to show, and that is 50 Years of Superman, the Julie Schwartz slide presentation that, uh, as it says right there on the screen, uh, took place at uh, Chattacon. Uh, back in January of 1988, the 50th yep. anniversary of Superman. So welcome. Uh, give people the uh, the background on how you were able to discover this video. Uh, well, it, it was less discovery than it was trash retrieval, dumpster diving. Uh, <laughs> back, uh, you know, Julie was an editor at DC Comics for uh, you know, over 40 years. He started in 1944. Uh, he retired in the late 80s. And um, he was moved from his regular, his old office in the editorials area to another smaller little editorial, uh, edit, editor emeritus kind of office. And, you know, all the stuff was boxed up and, and moved there. And over the next few years, Julie started, you know, just going through all the stuff he had, the, the files and the, and the stuff in the cabinet and the papers and the books. And slowly but surely, he was, you know, weeding out what he wanted to keep. And uh, throwing away uh, or, or giving away the rest of the stuff. And um, he would come to the office every Thursday, I think it was. And uh, mainly to uh, use DC's mail room and, and, and telephone. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sure. He, would come, he, would, he would come in and like, you know, call up Harlan Ellison and things like that. Um, so anyway, uh, I would always make it a point to, to visit him when he was there. You know, I, I missed him. I, I liked him. Um, and... Um, Sometimes when I'd come in, he'd be cleaning out a box or cleaning out a, uh, a file drawer and just throwing stuff into the waste paper basket. And, you know, I, I'm not the only one. I know Mark Wade did this as well. He would like, you know, go, no, and dive into the waste paper basket and retrieve whatever it is Julie had just tossed. Um, I did that with a lot of material. Uh, most of it was turned over to, the, uh, to, to DC's library, um, even though I dearly wanted to keep it. But. <laughs> but the history belonged with the company. There was this book. It was a ledger book from the 50s. Those big uh, old uh, cloth covered, you know, things with you, you screwed in the, the ledger pages. And each page was uh, a month of the comic publication with little thumbnails of the covers pasted onto the page. And under each cover uh, of every comic published that month were the sales figures. Wow. The print run, the sell through, the whole, every, all that information. Wow. Um, and uh, I had it in my office for years at DC and never got around to copying it, which is, is a shame. But it does reside in the DC Comics Library. 
Anyway, um, yeah. another one of those treasures I retrie retrieved was a videotape. You know, he said, what's this? And he goes, ah, it's this thing I did at conventions. And I went, well, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'll take it home and check it out. You know? And I took it home, never checked it out. And then it just kind of sat there in a closet and, you know, various storage boxes over the years. And uh, uh, in 2019, I had uh, 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 was moving again and, and, you know, came across it. And this time I, I put a, a shout out onto, uh, on the internet for uh, uh, someone to help, uh, um, uh, you know, to transfer it from video to, uh, to, to um, VHS to, you know, digital. digital and yeah. um, uh, Bob Singleton uh, uh, accept, uh, answered the call and, and, did, uh, and did a great job of, of restoring yeah. this tape. Uh, you know, it's a, it, it's a, a, a 40 plus year old uh, uh, video tape. Well, at the time, yeah, yeah. It's like Almost a 40, 40, 30 plus year old video yeah. tape. Yeah. And, you know, those things were not supposed to last this long. In the old days, we always warned that, you know, these things had like a 15 or 20 year shelf life before they deteriorated and you couldn't watch them anymore. Right. Thankfully, this one held up. And, um, you know, at, at, after I saw what it was, it's, you know, I, I knew I had to share it. Uh, it was just, you know, how to do it was the problem. Um, and uh, we did a show at the 2021 uh, Terrific Con here in Connecticut. Uh, we, we did a live uh, uh, showing of it at the convention. But, you know, there was like, what, two or three dozen people there? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we decided we that it needed to be a, uh, a world Internet premiere. Uh, Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, the audio audience will uh, be able to get a lot out of it just from the name checking that Julie does. But I do recommend to the audio audience that you do come to my YouTube channel and yeah. uh, and watch it here because you'll appreciate it more. That said, also, one of the reasons why I'm in the dark is I almost suggest you watch it in the dark because uh, Julie is in a dark, big convention room. Right. And it's a slide presentation. Now, when we cut to the slides, you're going to see them great. But Julie is very much going to be in the shadows. And uh, I'm not even sure what kind of resolution we're going to get showing it here on YouTube. But, yeah. uh, you know, just a little bit there. Well, you so, can always uh, recognize Julie, even if it's just a silhouette by the nose. So, ah, 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 ah. You know, <laughs> moments you can see them, but moments you can't. Hello, Brad. I'm glad you're joining us. That's great. And a lot of other people that are joining us on Twitter and Facebook and and um, and uh, and here on YouTube as well. Yeah, Brad didn't realize that uh, we'd actually get to watch the presentation. Oh, no. we. Ha I mean, it's great. And again, I'm so glad that you're a pack rat, Paul. And people could just go to your website <laughs> and see so many great things from scripts to comic strips to uh, book proposals. So many things. And it's just paulcupperberg.com, correct? Right. All right. Beautiful. Yes. Um, yeah. And, man, and uh, you know, also, this is th this, by the way, if you're an actor and need to do a Bronx accent, listen to this videotape. It sounds good. <laughs> um, all right. We've been talking long enough. I, I wanted to gather people before we actually started the video. Um, so uh, I'll be sharing the screen in a moment and we'll get things started. Um, let's see. I just want to make sure that I yes. Share tab audio is hit. Uh, everybody, including Paul, if we can't hear the sound, uh, please say something and I will, uh, I will stop us from, uh, you know, uh, I'll stop, I'll stop the, uh, the thing and restart it and everything, but you sh we should be able to hear the audio fine. So stand by everybody. Here, here we go. Okay. One second. There it is. And I'm going to make it bigger. Here we go. Look at the sky. Look, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Uh, 
Let me introduce myself. I'm Billy Schwartz. I've been a DC comic for 44 years. And I'm too bad to celebrate all the dog power. And uh, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Superman, which will culminate in Cleveland, the great book, not, not the great place, the bringing up uh, uh, city of Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster who created Superman. Uh, June 17th, 18th, and 19th will be a big uh, celebration of the Superman International Exhibition, and uh, we expect 10,000 people, which is even a little more than this convention. Now, the first picture I'm about to show, or I am showing, has absolutely nothing to do with Superman, in a way was taken 50 years ago. And it deals with science fiction personalities, writers, professionals, who used to gather about once a month and talk over science fiction. It was a professional convention. This is 1937. Mm -hmm. And these are all writers and people. Now, of these 10 people, I mean, I didn't even know that Superman existed. Of these 10 people, six would eventually play an important role in the life of Superman. In the top row, the fifth from the left is my oldest friend. We hope science fiction fan, not place fan magazine. His name is Mort Weissman. He was the editor of Superman from 1941 to 1970, which is about 30 years. And when he retired, I became editor for the next 17 years. So you see, between the two of us, we were the editor. Oh, incidentally, I'm in that picture too, kneeling down. Same one to the right, the fellow with the head. I can't believe I had it here. It's 19 uh, years ago. I did have to get it. Incidentally, please notice the dress code. In those days, you wore jackets, ties, even hats sometimes, not just a single thing. Going upstairs again, to the right of Mort Weisinger, the second from the left, is one of the top science fiction writers of the day who wrote many, many great Superman stories. His name is Edmund Hamilton. Neely, the first one on the left, is Otto Binder. He wrote many science fiction stories under the name Earl Eando Binder. Eando came from Earl, his brother Earl, and Otto became Eando, became Eando Binder. Later became this plain Otto Binder. And when he uh, stopped writing science fiction, or to a certain extent, he wrote a comic strip character called Captain Marvel. And he wrote most of the Captain Marvel stories. When we put Captain Marvel out of business, and I don't want to go into that story, he left Captain Marvel, came over with the Red Superman. That's out of business. Next to him is one of my great pals, one of the great science fiction and fantasy authors of all time, died last year, mainly Wade Well. <coughs> and that means, that's five members. You got one more to go. Before I tell you the, the last one, on the far right standing is oldest out of a climb was a, uh, a rival, so to speak, of Edgar Rice Burroughs, but wrote the same type of story. Standing the second from the left, 80 years old, still writing, and uh, he attends many science fiction conventions, L. Sprague the Camp. Next to him is Dr. Clark, and next to him is Frank Bellman Wong, another fantasy writer. That leaves left, the first one standing on the left, who was, who's been writing science fiction more than anyone who ever lived. He started about 1929, I believe, so he's almost ready to complete 60 years of writing science fiction. He's a grand master of science fiction. His name is Jack Williamson. Oh, <laughs> Incidentally, Robert Silverberg gave a funny remark when I showed him this picture. He said, my God, even 50 years ago, Jack Williamson was stooped over. Because he was stooped over. <laughs> okay, now how did Jack Williamson play a role? Well, he was the president of the Science Fiction Writers of America, 1978-1979. And he put a motion forward, which was carried, that Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster be awarded a plaque for the creation of Superman. And because Siegel and Schuster lived in California and the, and the Nebula Awards were being held in New York, I was asked to receive the award for them. And the next slide, please, will show me receiving the award. The Jack Lewis and I left them holding the plaque. So I would like to read what the plaque said. The Science Fiction Writers of America present this award to Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, originators of Superman, for creating an American myth. Next slide. This is the first drawing that Joe Schuster ever did of Superman about 1933. We see the hint of the Superman coming, like logo. Uh, he's wearing no cape, no S symbol, and it's, it's a roughly hoping up a villain being shot at by crooks and 
point about the local so to speak, and Jerry Siegel wrote down a genius and intellect, a very leading brain, and never never says the wrong words. The Superman, he didn't call him Superman, he says the Superman. Many of the early comic book characters were on board some information, he knows this. They had the way to it. it was the Flash, the Batman, the Green Lantern, the Hawkman. The only exception I can think of Wolf Air is the Wonder Woman. There was no, no Wonder Woman. Uh, so this is the first sketch that Joe Sister ever did. And the next slide will show the last one he ever did. Joe Sister is legally blind. Unfortunately, he cannot draw anymore. But I asked him in connection with the 45th anniversary of the appearance of Superman five years ago to do, me, do one more drawing of Superman. And he wrote me back as follows. This may be the last Superman drawing I will ever make due to the condition of my eyes. So this is the last thing. And of course he wrote down, pretty good even for a legally blind man. Congratulations and so on. Next slide. There was a, you were probably told that I put out, well, and what it is, the phrase, the phrase Spin magazine that came out in January 1932, the time Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster got an idea that they would put out a fan magazine, and they called it Science Fiction, the latter part of 1932. They put out about five issues, and five, those five issues recently were auctioned off at the Forest of the Acton auction for $1,900. Every graphic magazine, two, two drawings, not as small as graphic, as I say, and the drawings are by Joe Schuster. This is the first Superman story that ever appeared, but it actually had nothing to do with the Superman we know today. The Superman in this story was a villain. He had some vague superpowers. And you'll notice in the upper left hand corner says, no, okay, my favorite, that's fine. That is really Jerry Siegel. Jerry Siegel wrote the whole issue, but he didn't want people to know that they only had one item. So he came up with a super full of that's fine. And I asked him where he got the name Herbert that's fine. The name Herbert comes from his favorite cousin, Herbert. And he asked good for his last name, which coincidentally enough was short, so he had a cousin named Herbert Schwartz. Coincidentally, even more, the Vine was his wife, his mother's maiden name. Her name was Sylvia Vine. So they asked good for both Schwartz and Sylvia, and that's Herbert that's Vine. Jerry Siegel, first Superman story. Next. The fellow on the left is M.C. Gaines, Max Gaines, father of Bill Gaines, who now the publisher of Man Magazine. Max Gaines, M.C. Gaines, was the publisher of all American comics, which included Superman. Well, at least you saw part of it, Brad. Right? Go yeah, but, okay, you saw the best of it. Uh, he was the publisher of Superman, of uh, Greenland, Flash, Wonder Woman, Sensation Comics, and so on. And his editor was Sheldon Mayer, Shelley Mayer of Bill Honoray. Shelley in those days, beginning days, used to cut up cartoon scripts and put them in magazines. So it was very original, original, a very original artwork and stories done in those days. But Siegel and Schuster were trying to sell the Superman uh, concept as a newspaper syndicate, and they were very unsuccessful. In desperation, they sent it to all American comics. And Shelley Mayer thought it was a great idea. And by pasting it together, they could make a story out of it. He brought the idea to Gaines, and Gaines said he had no one to put it anywhere, but his partner, so to speak, to a certain extent, Harry Donovan up at DC Comics, was starting a new magazine called Action Comics, was looking for a lead feature. Why don't we send it up there? They did. They liked the idea. And so Superman was born, as we'll see in the next. This is a very famous first issue of Action Comics. Uh, I believe 230,000 copies were printed, of which very few exist today. If anyone should be fortunate enough to have number one, they're probably in a mint condition. Christine mm -hmm. Mint, they'll probably go for something like $80,000. We really don't know how many copies exist. Maybe a hint of those. There might be some copies in bad condition. But, okay, so this was a runaway hit. So that, of course, most of the copies were destroyed. No one thought the same comic print. They were including. 1988, know anything about it. So let's go to the next issue of Action Comics and see what happens. We do not see Superman. As a matter of fact, we do not even see Superman in issues 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, how can it be if Superman sold out the first issue of Action Comics they didn't bother with Superman back on the cover? Very simple. They didn't know about it. You see, when they put out issue number one, they're already prepared for issues 2, 3, 4, and 5. 
So when they looked over the returns, they tried to figure out what sold the magazine. Was it a, a, a title action comic with the fact that it had four or five stories in it, with the fact that it had a super, new character called Superman on the cover? They didn't know until they gave it a test. So I go to the issue number seven. You see Superman again. They had the trial while it's sure, sure enough, but Superman on the cover is so fabulously well. So uh, issue number seven again started the running. Now let's go to the next one. This is issue number 20. A very strange thing happened on this cover, which you'll probably not be aware of unless I point it out to you. So I will. They forgot what? Yes. They forgot the S on the U. So I think this issue may be worth a little more than other issues, but simple fact. For the first time, Superman's S, Superman's S disappeared. I hope that came out clear. All right, next one. Book about Siegel and Sisters, time we show what they look like, right? Well, obviously, the fellow drawing is Joe Sister, the one who did that legally blind drawing of Superman. The one standing over watching him draw is Jerry Siegel. Now, this is a picture taken from an article that appeared in the Saturday Evening Post, and it's called Up, 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 and Away. Two little anecdotes in connection with this that was uh, revealed. Jerry Siegel pulled up Harry Donnerfeld, who I mentioned before, asking for a $500 check. Harry said, I have nothing to do with that. Let me turn, pay you over to Jack Lee, which I treasure. And he said, Jack, I'd like to have a check for $500. Jack said, I just sent you a check for $500. Why do you need another $500? So Jerry said, well, I checked over my bank account, and I see I have $19,500 in my bank. I'd like to make it an even $20,000. Now, $20,000 up by today's figures is pretty close to a quarter of a million. So any stories you hear about Siegel and Schuster not being well paid for Superman, there's a false, outrageous lie. They're well paid. Now about uh, good old Joe Schuster. Let me get this paid. On December 31st, 1940, about two years after Superman was initiated, the newspapers across the country had headlines roughly like this. Superman's creator has hard time escaping beach jail. No, no. Superman gets his best beat a horse out of jail in Florida. That, that's from Superman frees creator from Miami Beach Jail. What does that all mean? Well, the officers were making good money by this time. And it was New Year's in tide of New York, it's cold. Horrible culture factory on the great bear 35 degrees below zero. He was going down to Florida, bath in the warmth and have a good time. Uh, Joe Schuster was not a well dressed. You see, he's working the shirt sleeves that a guy who yeah. He didn't shave that day. He had ragged clothes. And he looked like a big let's face it. So he walks up and down Lincoln Road, which is like the stair of Miami Beach. And he's looking at all these beautiful cars. He's making enough money now to afford to buy a car. But he wants to see what the insides look like. So he's peering in the window, looking this one. Now, all of a sudden, there's a tap on his shoulder. He's turned around. There's a cop grip. He says, what are you trying to do? See which one of these cars at the door open? You're trying to steal it? I'm taking you in. Took him into the precinct house. Locked. He was locked up. And poor George just kept protesting. I have, I, I make $300 a week. Hundred dollars, like three thousand. I, 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 I mean, the illustrator of Superman, which was well known by this time. Well, he didn't believe. It. So one enterprising reporter says, "Look, as long as he says he's the illustrator of Superman, give him a pencil and paper, let him draw Superman." And he did so. Well, please, we still not convinced. Poor Joe was sad and so on. What would somebody remember that is, of course, President of DC Comics, Harry Donnell, was staying in Florida, also at this time at the same hotel. He said, "Please call up my boy, Harry Donnell." And he'll vouch for him. Okay, what well, they got to lose the name of Paul? They call Kai Dow. Well, Kai says, nonsense. Your sister would never leave New York. You're not doing anything. <laughs> they played it, played it. So finally, Harry came down and said, oh, it really is your sister. Okay, I vouch for And that's how your sister spent a few hours in jail. And so it's not, not even Superman to get him out. Next. In 1976, we had a sort of a Superman celebration, and Siegel and Schuster came to New York and said they lived in Florida, uh, in, in California at the time. Well, on the far right is George Schuster. Next to him is Saul Harrison, who at this time was the president of DC College. In, in the middle is Jerry Siegel, I'm going to write the left cover. The ball kind of guy, does anyone recognize him? He did 
very popular television show recently. Alan, not really. Who's that? Alan Fudge. That's Alan Fudge. Then Candid Camera. Before that, did Candid Radio. He's a big fan of Superman. So he was invited to the party. The fellow on the left, the, the, he wrote some Superman stories, wrote a lot of Batman stories, wrote a lot of science fiction stories. His name is David Bray, and wrote on the name David B. Reed. Thank you. For the 65th birthday, which was uh, maybe seven years ago, no sister came up to DC Comics again, and then we threw a little birthday party for him. The girl on the left is our president of the public, a Jeanette Kahn of DC Comics. One of the most brilliant women you'll ever know about or meet. She should be fortunate enough to do so. I think uh, Esquire, one of those magazines, listed the 40 most prominent women businessmen in the country, and she was one of them. And that's what Joe's sister in the middle. The on the far right is an editor who's been with DC Comics almost as long as I have. His name is Murray Bolton. Joe was small, didn't have much breath, but he was grown up to do the bar thing in the next. Slide next slide. Which is simply the raw candle. I thought it was a nice time to show uh, a picture of Superman out of the tape. So I'll never be one that I his work. Happy birthday, Joe. Sir. Next. In 1985, I believe, I went to a convention in San Diego. It was Jerry Siegel, was guest of honor. He agreed to appear if I would appear with him. He was, he's kind of shy. I didn't want to do any program. He said he would sit at the DC booth if I would sit next to him, which I did. That's what we're doing there. And I had my picture taken for the record. At that point, I asked him, Tell me, where did you get the name Clark? He said, That's very simple. The name Clark came from the most romantic movie star of the day, Clark Abel. The name Kent came from his wife's brother in law, an actor named Kent Taylor. I don't know how many remember, but it was an actor back in that period, the 39 and 40s. Well, Ken Taylor, a great big movie. And that's how they get the name Clark Ken. I said, where did you get the name Carlel, which is the name of Superman? He said, well, I, I, I'm saving that for my autobiography. That's a surprise. I'm not telling you. I said, can you at least tell me where you got the name Jorel, who was the father of Superman? He said, that's simple. Jorel are various letters for my name. Oh, I, I said, no, wait a second. Where did, there's a J in there. There's an R in there, Jerry. And L for Siegel, where did you come from? I said to Jerry, he said, you keep calling me Jerry, but my name is Jerome. So the first Superman story was signed by Jerome Siegel, so the old name was Jerome. And that's how the name Jerome. Next. I mentioned what wife we before. He began at the Superman from 1941 to 1970. Incidentally, he sat for a few years during the war. He was there. At this period of time, he was the editor of really one story. The fellow next to him was the editor of the main story. When I got out of magazine in 1960 called The Adam, it dealt with the world's smallest superhero. He was able to shrink himself inside six feet, say, to six inches. Now, he was The Adam. Now, all superheroes, characters have uh, a civilian name. And I thought, Phil, what am I going to call him? I decided to call him Ray Palmer. Why did I call him Ray Palmer? Because the fellow standing with Ward Blyden is the real Ray Palmer. Raymond A. Palmer. And it's a amazing story. He had an accident when he was a kid, and his spine from um, one sort or another, and never grew more than maybe four to eight, four to ten inches tall. So, anytime you people read the atom, it does come out again. Or if you're familiar with the atom, Ray Palmer really exists. That's a book. Next. When Moore gave up the editorship in 1970, and I took over in 71, I thought I'd keep his name before the readership, so to speak. And I had a bus full of Clark Kent's apartment, which was the one like Ward Weiser. And I remember Clark Kent came into the house. He took over his hat and threw it on the board. He said, Good evening, Morty. That's it. Private little joke. Thanks. <laughs> this is Jack Schiff who took Ward's place when Ward went into the Army. And uh, he was only supposed to stay there a couple of years to work that out. But we had built up DC Comics so much that Jack Schiff remained behind. I was actually the managing editor of DC, of DC Comics for 25 years. He had two important things I'd like to tell you about. One is when we sued Captain uh, Boys of Magazine, to discontinue Captain Marvel because of their, we felt, plagiarism of Superman. Jack Schiff dug up all the material that was brought to a court of law and helped us with the case. He also was writing a Superman syndicate script going to war. And one day he got a visit from the FBI. 
They said, we want you to cease and the sister saying that Superman can't do for you. Jack and Barry said, why, 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 what did I do? He said, we are giving you orders, cease and desist, go to get another story. Only later, after the war, Jack was told that the Superman story at this point dealt with a cyclic product, which deals with atomic energy, atomic bombs, and so on. And they felt that any hint that we were working on a cyclic product would tip off the Germans. So a similar thing happened to John W. Campbell of the Stanley story when he printed a similar type of story. That coincidentally, a story written by James Cardinal always foretold what the what the chemical formula would be for it, exploding an atom bomb. And Campbell protested, but Campbell won the case. He said, if we cut out those things, it'll be even more suspicious. We've always been the stories about atomic energy and atomic bombs. If we stop printing these types of stories, the Germans surely will catch up. Next. This is E. Nelson Bindle, was my uh, assistant for many, many years. He knew everything that ever happened to Superman. Whenever we had a question to talk about, we asked Nelson Bindle. As a matter of fact, when I took over Superman, and he became my assistant, I said, and I came up with what I thought was an original idea, I'd always pause and say, now, what was when I thought alike? It's very possible what came up with a similar idea. So I check it out with Nelson. And maybe every once in a while that happened. So I'd have to change the story. He died last year. Next. This is Kurt Swan, who many people, as well as I, consider the, the definitive Superman artist. He was absolutely great. Many artists hope someday to ink a Kurt Swan story because he, he told the story better than anyone else, and they wanted the line by inking a Kurt Swan story. This is about 1961, as you can tell by the crew cut he's wearing, and he's in the process of drawing the cover. Okay, next slide. When I became editor of Superman, that's why I held on to Kurt Swan. And here we are, about 1971, and we're going over a story. I'm asking for a change in the artwork. What the artist would do is bring up the artwork, and I'd check over the story to make sure he did what he was supposed to do. If something wasn't clear or inaccurate, he asked to change it. Here I am in the process of doing it. This is my office, by the way, and every cover that came out, I was editing, I'd put on the wall so I'd see uh, that I would repeat myself before. Next slide. This is Ray Anderson who inked most of the Kate Swan stories. As a matter of fact, if you sometimes see an artwork by Swanson, the ink name came Swan, let's do letters A N, and also A N from Anderson. So we got Swan and Anderson became Swanson. He also was the defender of the Superman. Thank you. I realize, of course, that if you're not familiar with Superman, you may not know what's going on, but I show this because I do this at comic book conventions. And maybe you do know, these are various artists and the way they do Superman. It basically is the same. Starting off with Paul, with Joe Sister, who is the originator of Superman. You have Dick Sprang, Al Bastino, Craig Schaffenberg, Wayne Boring, and Jim Boogie. Wayne Boring was the artist after Jerry, after Joe Sister gave up for Superman for one reason or another. Uh, Wayne Boring took over and did that. And in the newspaper said it was when Wayne Boring was uh, actually fired by board for some reason. He never told me. Kids want to Next. The more I went, they tried to get many by Superman covers. There's Kate Swan and Murphy Anderson and Roy. Neil Adams, many people consider the probably the top cartoon artist. All the way from Murphy Anderson. Ross Andrew, I'll show a picture of him later. I think you down at that concept of Superman. And finally, Dick Dillon and Joe Jello. While Dick Dillon did do Superman in the magazine, in the Superman magazine, he did Superman in the Justice League of America story. Next slide. This is Ross Andrew, I mentioned. I want to point out the fact that he did the French collaboration artistically, that is, between DC Comics and Marvel Comics. He did a story involving Superman and the Amazing Spider Man. And he did the artwork on that. And I also think that was a mistake because he gave the boost that Spider Man needed to actually finally overtake Superman and fail. So this is Ross Andrew, who's also working for Marvel Comics after DC Comics. Now working for us again. Next. If any advertiser wants to use Superman in their layouts, artistically, otherwise, we demand that it be done absolutely correct. So we provide what I call style, a style guide. And this is how Superman should be drawn. 
That is depicted a lot by the done by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, one of the top artists, I think by Dick Giordano, who was a Jackson Vice President of the United And this is a typical type of thing. If you want to show, show the change of Superman going into that telltale telephone booth and um, becoming Superman, that telephone booth is playing a important role in Superman. And no one really knows why. It never appeared in the Superman story. The change like that never appeared. Actually, it appeared as a ventilator in a cartoon script. We can get away with it. So this is the job of Superman. That's it. Thanks. When I think over Superman, I thought they'd have a little fun, and I said to myself, if Chris Swan didn't do Superman the way he did, he was an other artist who gave him the job, what would happen? So I had Chris Swan do the basic drawing on the right, a bull-headed figure of Superman with the S and a bull-headed figure of Clark Kent. Now let's see what another artist would do with it. Now the top one, so they get to my card. Is Nick Dillon, who I mentioned in the Justice League, is he his concept? What next to him is Sergio Anagatis, famous for Man Magazine, the drawing of the Wacky Next is Mike Kaluga, don't do it, come up with work. This is that, you know, it's the eye patch changing from one eye to another with the time hat. Next to him is Ray Robert, who somehow I never could figure out. Came up with a crazy head with Superman, even the coke evidently, and looking like Benjamin Franklin. You know? <laughs> and uh, below is Howie Victor Chaykin, just starting out nowadays, of course, he's known as Howard Chaykin, who was the American flag and the shadow, and, and over and then recently came out with Black Hawk. In those days, known as Howard Victor Chaykin. Next slide. Ken Swan, my top left thought he'd have another 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> top right is Joe Cuban. I don't know at this point in time is drawing past I learned this concept of how Superman and the clock has to look. And now we have Fred Schaffenberger with the uh, the wood block with the glasses. Next to him is that great Neil Adams. And lower left is Joe Orlando, who is another executive vice president of the Monroe's. And the far right is our executive vice president, President G Dick Giordano, with a little house of mystery horror on the left. There we go to the next slide. In June of this year, we had the beginning of the celebration of the 50th anniversary, and I've done it at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. And we have a lot of Superman memorabilia there. Anyone goes to Washington, please go to the Smithsonian and look up the Superman stuff. Very valuable stuff. The best Superman with action comes out of custom and so on. And Chris Watt appeared. And I was saying, gee, I wonder if I can take advantage of that. And I said to Chris Watt, did you ever meet? John Brain. Now, John Brain is the one who is redoing Superman, so to speak. And he said, No, I haven't met John Brain. I said, Let me have the privilege of introducing you to him. I took a pencil, stuck it in his hand. I said, Chris Watt, you're handing over the drawing pencil of Superman to John Brain. And that's the picture that I Of course, Chris Watt's on the right hand. You know, he's got a gray hair now. And there's John Brain, the battle of John Brain, who is the greatest Superman artist in the world. Jerry Ordway, who also was writing and uh, collaborating with John Wayne, and illustrated Superman. And he's a two great artists. Yeah, they really are very good. One of their big redheads. No support that he's wearing a Superman pen over there. Next slide. Uh, uh, there are a couple of writers that uh, wrote Superman. When I started Superman in 71, I wanted to do everything different. I wanted to minimize his power, I wanted to change his wardrobe. I want to get rid of kryptonite. I want to take clock hands out of radio, equipment, television. I did all these things, hoping they were going to do all this. Unfortunately, they did not. At that period of time, they wanted the traditional Superman. Who did I pick the right? This fellow who was at that time my best writer, he wrote a great series of Batman stories. That's Denny O'Neill. Denny O'Neill is now away from Russia and Canada. And still writing with some, uh, he did a, uh, a book that the mom was coming out without a shadow with my blue weapon. He's still writing for us. I think he did the question of a few other things. He did the Doc Savage when he said it. That's the name of it. You know, so I still have the author of the question about the author. Next. This is my other writer, Carrie Bates, who has been a Superman story for at least 20 years. Still writing for us, not doing Superman. I think in 20 years you've had it. Next. 
Okay, I certainly started in 38. It became very popular very quickly. And they put out a radio program, we broadcast every day of the week, 15 minutes long. And these are three personalities. The fellow on the left is Harry Dabbelt, who I mentioned before, who was the publisher of DC Comics. The fellow on the middle is Brett Collier, who played the role, dual roles of Park Kent and Superman. And the young lady is Jane Alexander, who played the uh, little slave. Now, the program was done live. And what Kanye had written in his contract, I'm entitled to a two-week vacation. They said, but wait a second, how can we do a Superman radio show every day of the week and not have Superman appear? He said, that's my problem, I've got a contract. Turn it over to your scriptwriters. So the scriptwriters thought, thought, came up with an idea. They invented a thing called Kryptonite, which are remnants of his home planet Krypton, which, if we're close enough to Superman, will make him powerless, helpless, and everything else. He practically would collapse. So they worked out a story in which Superman was fighting a villain, and all of a sudden the villain whips out a hunk of kryptonite, and Superman collapsed. They threw him into a room while they went out to rob a bag or something. <coughs> so while Superman was caught in the room, helpless was a kryptonite, and he was struggling to get out. So for two weeks, all you heard was an off-stage voice saying, like, <laughs> That was Superman for two weeks. So the danger was over. He went to Kaya and Superman managed to break out of the trap storage room <coughs> Next. Now, in 1939, New York City held the World's Fair. And they asked us to prepare a Superman Day in the World's Fair, which they had to be one of the most popular days they ever had. They wanted someone to dress as Superman. And this fellow, standing up, you see the power of the president over there, which is typical of the Superman. Yes. I noticed that the yes. Well, Wait, wait, I'm doing this show, not you. <laughs> well, we didn't have much information, or we didn't have time to do it. We dragged up, we dug up, dragged up, or worked out the costume, got some time <coughs> somewhere or other, and put him in this beautiful. And this is the first appearance of Superman in public. And the next slide will show what this fellow is coming to you. Next slide. Well, to make sure those people who didn't know who read Superman would know what this is all about, we had a nest, not the correct one. And Superman written out, but we won't know that Superman. No one remembers who this fellow is. Well, he will have to go down an unknown Superman without a history, uh, without a speech like that. I also remember animation was real early that you had a black ass. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the only Superman were not always consistent. The answers kept changing. Next slide. Let me get to my, uh, let me have my card. Superman also went into the movies. And this is the fellow who played Superman the first time around, Kirk Allen. Superman, uh, Adam Ann played the Superman. And of course, he put him in the telephone booth to do a publicity picture. And he knows the cute fact of the mirror and so on. Next slide. When Jerry Siegel went to Sweden to receive some kind of reward for his creation of Superman, they asked him to pose. This is not even a picture from a, news, a Swedish newspaper, so it's not that clear. They asked him to pose in the telephone booth, the telephone telephone booth, for the next journey. And we have Lois Lane doing the story. Now, that, that really is Lois Lane. It, it is also Jerry Siegel's wife. She was the original model for Lois Lane. Her name is Joanne, Joanne Siegel, the original model that Joe Shifty used to get Lois Lane. So it turned out to be fine. The real Lois Lane is covering the story. Next slide. Well, I figured as long as everyone's getting into the telephone booth, that I would get into it. So this also was taken at this result. It's funny the institution. We pulled it in front of the uh, Superman telephone booth. Next slide. Here's Craig Allen attending a comic book convention, uh, being on it uh, playing the role of Superman. He had someone he asked him to pose for a picture with the, the cardboard uh, cutout of Superman. Next. Here's Craig in one of his movie roles about to leap out of a window. And the next slide we show, but Kaya who took over coming in to the window. This is part of the television series he did. And uh, it was Many people 
to this day, as good as Christopher Reeve was, they still, many still like George Reeve, but it was many wonderful television shows. In New York, I don't know if they did it out here, but also Los Angeles, they had, I think they showed all the early television, Superman, that George Reeve television show. Very well, got the highest rating for that day. Next slide. We also did some Superman movies. Now, we did it in black and white, because there was no color in those days. Now, Superman, this uh, George Reeves appeared in his traditional uniform, it would come out wrong, so to give an appearance of the way it really looked. Otherwise, if we did it in black, we did it in red and yellow, it looked terrible. So this is the color scheme they use in order to get a close reproduction of the authentic uniform. And we took, we, not me, people took three television shows, took them together, and called the Superman Flies again, and only showed it in Europe. We've never shown it in America. Next slide. People came once in a while writing, we have an autograph picture of Superman. So we said him there, he knows his best wishes George Reeves. I mean, he considered himself Superman. He wasn't going to sign it Superman. He thought best wishes George Reeves. Strangely enough, as the next slide will show, George Reeves wasn't even his real name. It was George <laughs> Rosello. This is a picture taken when he was in uh, I think the Pasadena Playhouse trying to uh, uh, become an actor, letting his and so on. So George Reeves' the real name is George Michelle. You still can recognize him, of course. Isn't that the uh, next slide? Well, the Superman television show did so well, we decided to go ahead, at least tell the Kellogg serial people, ask for a, a pilot that was Superboy. And we actually shot one with this fellow named Johnny Rockwell. Unfortunately, Kellogg decided to change his mind at the end, and they never did do that Superboy uh, series. And this is, we do have uh, that pilot around, maybe someday will be shown. I'd love to show it at the convention, which probably none of you have ever seen. Next slide. This is the cartoon show. Very, very effective. John Crane admits having a lot of the Superman stuff from, or well, at least the action post, from the cartoon show put out by Max Fleischer. I think there were 17 of them. This is a black and white shot, and the next one shows a very effective color shot. Next slide. I mean, look at the gravity. Here we get Superman struggling. You know, they, they kept giving Superman such superpowers that there was no problem to do anything. But here he is struggling to warn off lightning. And he's struggling, he's struggling. And in fact, he gets pushed back from lightning. And he goes back and forth. And finally, he overcame the game. And I, I, this is my favorite shot in the cartoon show. As I pointed out, they, they did the telephone booths in the cartoon series. Of course, it was very picturesque. They'd have Clark had seen something. Stop into a telephone booth to change. And of course, would say, This is a job for Superman, sort of high voice. And when he changed, and he leap out and say, Oh, oh, by the way, you know, with a low voice. Everyone would forget that going into a telephone booth, the whole view of the public is kind of silly, but he got away with it, but you never saw anyone in public anyway. He never did it in the house. Thanks. <laughs> Well, glad to recognize you'll see the ball because this is a show she shot in 1956 and she gave her son the Superman a birthday party and she played the best self the Superman God in the role. And it was popular enough that the next slide shows Saturday Night Live did one too. What for actors? He killed the rat that Dan Ackroyd, Bill Murray, Margo Kiddo, who played the Lord's Play. This is about. Uh, 1978, 1979. Just a whole 10 years ago. Next slide. So it was popular up to appear as a Broadway musical. And here's the billboard that came out. Best musical in town and so on. Starring Jack Cassidy, many of you know, he did not play the role. He played the, the villain role, not a costume villain. And we had uh, Bob Holiday as Superman. One of the lines in the show was as follows. Uh, Bob Holiday was asked, someone asked scornfully, where did you get that name? And Bob Holiday and Superman soberly and thoughtfully thought for a while and replied, it seemed to fit. No laugh? Okay. He didn't get the laugh from the Broadway show either. <laughs> yeah, it didn't last too long, maybe less than half a year probably. But it did do well enough on the opening. Uh, not critically reviewed the next slide of the show. It, it is traditional when the show opens on Broadway. But 
for Hirschfeld to do a cartoon. Now we see some men flying above. The one on the lower left is the wacky sign. The one on the right is the other building of the Jack Cassidy. And the one in the middle is the secretary of Jack Cassidy. Does anyone recognize her, by the way? Linda Lavin. Linda Lavin, right? She played the role of Jack Cassidy. Linda Lavin played the role of Alice many years ago. That's Linda Lavin. Next. This fellow played a very important role in my life. As a matter of fact, it wasn't for him. I wouldn't have been talking to you today. Before I became an editor of the DC Comics, I was a science fiction agent. And this fellow was one of my clients. During the war years, there weren't enough science fiction magazines to sustain him and his wife, so he wrote comics. His most prominent comic, comic was Greenland. As a matter of fact, he wrote the old that Greenland takes the brightest day and blackest night, and we will shall escape my sight. That those who worship you with might beware my power. Greenland is that. One day he came over and said, Julie, why don't you get out of the Walmart and the comics and apply for that editor job? I know you're not making much money, I know probably any science you can be busy today. And take a job as an editor with all American comics. But I contested, I said. I've never read a comic book in my life. How can I possibly do it? He says, it's not that important. They merely want a story and it's some of the plot stories. I know you can do that damn well, but you do it with me. So I went down and applied to the job. It was 44 years ago, and I'm still breaking it. This fellow went on to write science fiction stories. He's written two of the very best science fiction stories of all time. One is called The Demolished Man. The other one called The Stars of My Destination. By this time, I revealed his name is Alfred Vesper. He's supposed to be guest of honor at the Wilcom, the last year in England, never made it, he died in, I believe, the end of September. One of my best friends, as I say, it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. Now, why do I show you this picture? Nothing to do with Superman. I haven't even mentioned the word Superman, so I'll now tell you why. He's here. When Elias Salford, the producer of Superman, the eventual Superman got the idea of producing Superman. He came up to the office and negotiated the deal. Now we signed a contract with him. And it was signed, he says, Can you suggest anyone who could possibly write the Superman movie? So I thought, well, I, had, I said to him, I officially have two suggestions. One is Lee Brackett. Lee Brackett was also a client of mine, and uh, he was a science fiction writer, and she had written a number of screenplays. First one being uh, The Big Sleep with Puffy Bogart or Lauren McCall. She wrote that because she didn't fall from the start of the writer because she broke the defense story for people. She also wrote many of the John Wayne movies, those that began with Rio, Rio Loco, this, Rio, and that. The last time I saw Lee Brackett, which incidentally I introduced to her husband, Edmund Hamilton. The last time I saw and he had died a year or so earlier, she came up to the office and was very flushed with excitement. Lee, Lee, what's the matter? He says, let's go out to lunch. Uh, something very exciting has happened to me. I, I just want to sit down and tell you. We went down, we go to the cocktail. He said, wish me luck. I said, okay, by this time, tell me what's, what's the big news. He says, I've just been hired by George Lucas to write the Empire Strikes Back, which he did. He wrote the script of the Empire Strikes Back. Unfortunately, died before she was able to finish it. So if you ever see the Empire Strikes Back, Story by Lee Brackett and whoever else is in it. Billy Sapper says, well, where does she live? I said, I'm in California. He said, no, we don't have a car. Can you mention someone else? I mentioned Alfie Preston. Alfie came up to the office. Billy Sapper was very impressed with Alfie. He says, it looks like a good deal to me. We got an agent. He said, yes, I do. Late in last again. They called up an agent. They made some kind of a financial deal, which I don't know about. And they were to sign the contract Friday. This is on Monday or two. Meantime, Elliot, Elliot was Post to his body, found the writer of the Superman. And the father, Pierre, or whatever his name was, I can't remember. Uh, who did you get? And he says, Alfie Preston. Who the hell is Alfie Preston? He probably said in some foreign language. Never heard of him. We can't have an unknown do a Superman movie. Forget it. Meantime, Alfie had written a sort of a treatment of how Superman should be treated. And the question I obviously know, the contact was never signed. I often wonder if the deal had gone through and Alfie had written that Superman movie. What a great Superman movie. Good as the question was, his would have been better. I know it. So that's the core story about Alfred Preston. Next. 
This is a shame for time. Okay, I gotta go pass out there for one. Um, I don't want This is a scene from the first Superman movie. You know, there's a bottle of champagne on the table. Uh, Superman doesn't drink, but he had a date with Lois Lane. He wanted to do a press. So we're pressing a lady and bring a bottle of champagne, right? Well, Superman, where's Superman going to get a bottle of champagne? He has no money on him. He has no money in his pockets. Where can he possibly get a bottle of champagne? He wondered about that, too. So he used his telescopic vision to look around, try to find a bottle of champagne. And all of a sudden, 3,000 miles away, he sees the Queen of England about to launch a battleship. And she has a bottle of champagne in her hand, and she's about to swing it down on the ship. Superman swoops in at indivisible speed, grabs the bottle of champagne out of her hand, and brings it back to Lois Lane. That scene did not appear in the movie. You know why? We objected. We can't actually have Superman steal a bottle of champagne from the Queen of England. So the bottle of champagne just got there. That's how, without explaining how we got there, it's there. Next. Gene, Gene Hackman didn't want to appear as the little bit of bald headed villain until the very end. Now, she was incidentally, I got a tagline, when Alfred Bester was sent down to write the Superman movie, you know, if you all remember, the fellow who was hired to do it was Mario Puccio, who wrote The Godfather. Mario Puccio wrote the screenplay, which I just explained the scene. He also wrote a scene in this story. They didn't know who played the role, they knew it had to be a bald headed Luther. So, Superman. And this particular scene was looking for Luther who was about to commit a crime. And it's a night scene, and he's flying over with Tropos on patrol, and all of a sudden he finds that bald headed guy in the trench coat, and he comes down and grabs him, and he says, Gotcha, and he swings him around, and this bald headed guy looks at him and says, Who loves you, baby? He was telling Sagala to doing a cameo role, I suppose. I said, No way, that's too okay, careful, not going to lie. Next slide. Faye Dunaway appeared in Supergirl as the villain. She was not originally considered to play the role. It was over to someone else. This young lady read the script and said, no, no, I, I, I don't think this is a role for me, and she didn't do it. Now, if she had accepted, instead of Faye Dunaway the role, this actress would have been, are you ready for this? Dolly Parton. Next. Oh. <laughs> right. You see, they this Chris Reeve, I want to call Chris, I have to do Chris Reeve came up to the office one day, of course, we're going to have a, a lottery, a switch plate drawing. Um, the winner would get the Superman uh, king. That was one of the pictures. Here he is looking at a Superman flying pose and saying, that's a good way to fly Superman. Next, the one on the right is Sal Harris again, right there. And here he is, about, we're about to draw the uh, winning ticket. He's got it in his hand. Go to the next slide. And here's Sal Harris looking up. Look at that look on Chris Reeve's face. You know why he's nervous? He's very nervous at this point. He found out that all the young ladies, all the secretaries at the Water Communications Building knew that Chris Reeve, Superman, was in the building. They're all waiting at the hall and reception room to tear his clothes apart. <laughs> and he didn't relish the idea of going past all these ladies. We said, nothing to worry about. We'll sneak you out to the freight elevator. So, you got to work with that. Whenever he came up to the office, girls like to have poses with him. In this particular pose with a young lady in the office in the production department. I show you this picture mainly to indicate and prove to you that even in the presence of a pretty girl, Superman can sweat. Was <laughs> <laughs> I had something there? Thanks. This is the uh, story I did Superman vs. Muhammad Ali. When it appeared in Italy, it did not appear as Superman vs. Muhammad Ali. It appeared as Superman. Which is Cassius Clay, the real name of Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali being a Muslim name. In Roman Catholic Italy, they weren't going to allow a Muslim to appear on the cover with Superman. Next slide. When the Act Magazine came out, we had uh, Muhammad Ali come up to publicize that name is not his name. I'm sorry, I can't tell you the whole story. I'd have to go full speed ahead. Next. <laughs> <laughs> He says, I am the greatest, I'm Superman. I walked Superman in the story tonight. The next. <laughs> if anyone comes up to our office and says, you'll stop for a moment, you come into the reception room, this clock head meeting, not the daily plan for Polly, the Wall Street Journal, why not? One communicates the stock is doing. So I took a picture pose. This is me on the left, Mark Wolfman, one of our top writers, and the part on the next day was Paul Levitz, one of our vice presidents, also writing the Legion of Superheroes. Next. 
I was in a, a bus to Superman in my office, and they want to take my picture. I would pose with Superman. That, a painting of Superman that's been in our office in 1939, Governor Hugh Ward. No one knows who convinced, but it's one of the very most effective Superman paintings I've ever seen. Next. The running story is the next one to set on the time. First Mutiny, Superman, 1953. Next. Uh, this is a, we take an issue of Superman and do a special edition for the Navy. This is the same Superman that appeared on the newsstand, but we had a very elementary vocabulary so the Navy people can understand the language. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, it couldn't read very well. Next. Uh, from time to time, we have celebrities appear with Superman. This particular case of Lewis and Well. Hope you all know who he is. I'm not going to say it. Next. Oh, what? And this is a special issue we did uh, for President Kennedy. Unfortunately, this is the issue that was about to come out. Uh, Kennedy was shot and killed, and uh, we thought we'd kill a book, but Lyndon Johnson said, please go ahead with it. Next. Superman of various companies throughout the world. Next. At one point, we thought we had a rival Disneyland called Superman Land. We had this built in one city in the United States it's called Metropolis, in Southern Illinois. And this is this concept that Neil, Ad Neil Adams drew. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't go ahead. It was going to the period of the gas points. The only way you get out of Southern Illinois and drop this by car, we felt that not enough people would be willing to spend the money to get the gas to go. So it's put on hold. Still on hold. Next. So remember the Superman Club? This is what you got. Next. Another Christmas card we sent out in connection. This time from Clark Kent and Superman. Next. The most valuable Superman uh, commercial item, telephone, I think goes for about $700 now. If you're lucky enough to find one. Next. During the Macy's Day Parade in New York, we have a Superman quote. This is it. I wish I could tell you more stories, but I have done it, and I got to go. Next. Uh, this is the first issue of Superman I ever did. I have Neil Adams drawing the cover. Uh, and I told you before I got rid of Kryptonite, I got rid of. Uh, uh, I put Superman in different flow, a uh, pocket in different flow, they put them on the radio for the television. So a lot of stories are connected with that. I just don't have time to go. It comes with a comic book convention sometimes. Yeah. Well, thanks. All right, excellent. But not a race for Superman. I have many artists who have Superman to do a pinup for me. And among those is Milton Kinnick. Unfortunately, I could not use it before you put Steve Cannon in there, and, and it's a syndicate copyrighted feature. We take too much trouble and expense to try to get terms on it. So I show you an exclusive shot of what Milton Kinnick drew. Next. Uh, one day they surprised me put out a special Superman issue, which I co starred with Superman. It was a special birthday surprise. I have the issue, and uh, this is the cover whenever anyone of port comes up to the office. I haven't signed it. I do want to point out it's so filled now that when two celebrities came up last, they had a sign in the black area. Next to my head in the black area is a glove for a red berry. And in the black area underneath is a jewelry got a surprise for you. There's a description by uh, my guy at his name, Mark, uh, Mark, 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 uh, when I gave up Super Nate, there was a party for me, and a lot of people came around. And this young lady is reading a telegram about how he used it. 17, this is what I gave up in 17 years. 17 years running Superman's life is enough already. Let the big Krypton monster suffer at the less adept hands, and you come out here to California for a decent meal. Just follow the yellow brick road, kiddo. Out here we've got a mountain of blood with the name Schwartz on it. Must be yours. Ain't no other Schwartz is in this area. Sign Paul and Ellison. <laughs> Next. This is, I showed you the place of Superman I did. This is the last one. Superman's tears in his eyes are really pitch ones because the last Superman he drew, we thought he would draw. And this is how we felt about it. We're all wishing a farewell. Ben Swan is down here. He had Khan. That was a big well me. A lot of other characters. Now, when I was going to do the last issue of Superman, what, what would I do? What, what would the story contain? I had to think of something monumental. And it suddenly struck me. It's basically enough for me to talk in the morning what I'd have to do. I was going to make believe this would be the 
last Superman story ever written. And the magazine would be discontinued. If that was so, I'd have to clear up a lot of things. Did Lois Lane ever find out that Superman is Clark Kent? Did she ever marry? What happened to Jimmy Olsen? What happened to Baniac? What happened to Luther? What happened to Perry White? What happened to all the villains, Baniac, and so on? What happened? So I told this, I wanted to check out the idea with a friend of mine. I was having breakfast with him. And I said, this is the idea I have. He patiently listened. Listen. He said, uh, well, at that point, he stood up, put his hands around my neck. And he said, if you let anybody else but me write that story, I'll kill you. But not willing to be an accessory to my own murder, I let that fellow write the story. Who is this fellow? I hope when I mention his name, it means something to you. Of course, he's the best goddamn comic book writer in the business today, Alan Moore. Alan Moore wrote my last two Superman stories. So not only is this my last Superman issue, it's my last slide. Thank you for your attention. Absolutely, yay. <laughs> so there you go, everybody. There it is. Yeah. Thanks again, Paul, for sharing that. That's oh, amazing. Pleasure. You know, this is the type of stuff you, you have to you have to let free out into the world. You can't just keep it and you know, you know on the shelf. Well, and also Thank God for things like Michael Urie's publications, like Back Issues. Absolutely. And, you know, Alter Ego, Roy's, Roy's Magazine, and uh, a website that you've been doing a lot of work with lately, 13th Dimension. And right. I mean, you guys are the people that are setting the record straight because uh, I think with the best intentions, a lot of misinformation gets passed around and, and shared as fact. And and that's why this thing is so amazing. And just the litany of not only comic book people, but sci-fi writers and creators that Julie rattles off right at the beginning. Sure. And, and pointing out his relationship with the sci-fi community. And literally, the three guys that created uh, sci-fi fandom, himself, Mort Weisinger, and uh, Forrest Ackerman. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, he was... Um, uh he was a talented man. Um, he, he was a pain in the ass, but he was a talented man. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he for, for 50 years, he was, you know, helping direct a lot of some of the best creators in, in his, you know, in his fields. Um, you know, he's the guy who, who sold the first Ray Bradbury stories to the pulp magazines, you know. Uh, I, I was going to say, he discovered Ray Bradbury, but Ray pursued Julie. Um, okay. You know, like, you're going to be my agent. Uh, so. Wow. But. And, um, yeah, no. Well, I was going to ask, um, while you were, while you were working with him over the years, I imagine you, you've met Ray Bradbury in the past. I'm assuming you did. Maybe, maybe not. Did you? I met him once. Okay. Um, it was at a San Diego convention. Um, and, and I have to admit, I have never been able to finish a Ray Bradbury book. Wow. I, I, I don't know what it is. I've tried, Interesting. Uh, but you know, I just can't read his stuff. I just, it, it just, uh, isn't my cup of tea. I'm not, Fair it's enough. nothing against him. It's just okay. a personal taste. 
Um, I... But um, at the San Diego convention, this was in the, um, <clears throat> I guess in the, the early 90s, might have even been in the 80s, I don't remember, but uh, uh, Bradbury was a guest. Um, and this was like the pre wheelchair days. So he was Understood. still, Bradbury was still, you know, uh, relatively healthy. Um, and, and Julie was so excited to be introducing me and others in his stable to Ray Bradbury. You know, it, it was like, you know, the, he, he was showing off to both sides, you know, I sure. Because he was proud of, of all of us in, in some way. Um, but. <clears throat> You know, and usually when you meet a Ray Bradbury, it is obligatory for you to launch into, oh, my God, I love Martian Chronicles, uh, uh, ice cream suit, whatever it is. Um, I couldn't do that. <laughs> so as we're shaking hands, you know, Julie probably makes the introduction. And as we're shaking hands, I suddenly remembered and I said, oh, wow, you know, I was just watching Moby Dick uh, a few weeks ago. And, um, you know, I remember what a brilliant screenplay you you wrote for that movie, for a great movie. And he just lit up. It was like, oh, that's everybody great. talks to him about the books, the science fiction. But, you know, and he started, he spent like 10, 15 minutes telling me and Julie uh, stories, you know, John Hausman stories. Uh, because he was in Ireland working with Hausman on the screenplay as they were filming. You know. Uh, um, yes. He, he, uh, he came up with the ending of the movie, you know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, he wrote a book about that, uh, about that experience. And I tried to read that book and I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> not to correct you, but it was John Houston. Not John, John Houston, Houston, I'm sorry. Yes. Well, that's all right. Because honestly, another interesting little wrinkle of that story is um, Houston really tortured him uh, writing oh, that screenplay. Yeah. And, yeah. and in fact, uh, his uh, Bradbury's revenge was a short story called The Banshee. And it, and in fact, oh, okay. they uh, adapted it for Ray Bradbury Theater, the old TV show. And Peter O'Toole played the John Huston role. And essentially, okay. it's about a writer that's being tortured by his director. And uh, the director tells him the legend of the Irish Banshee. And a Banshee comes and attacks the director. So uh, not to spoil. Choke, how but, ironic. Yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, pretty amazing stuff, man. Um, now, someone had a question. Here it is uh, from uh, David Skelton. David is doing uh, comic research on the Kryptonian uh, god, Rao, great Rao. He yes. traced the first appearance to World of Krypton uh, back issue to Superman 248 by Wolfman. Maybe it was a, a backup feature. But he asked Marv, who didn't know, who invented the concept of Rao? Do you know, Paul? I don't know. Um, it sounds like something, you know, Marv or Len or, or, or Elliot Magan would have come up with. Um, uh, either that or there was a spaghetti sauce tie-in that fell through. I, but, isn't that crazy um, that there is the Rao spaghetti sauce? You're right about that. Yes. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I walk by, by the aisle, it's like great row. Yeah. Cause I, I spent I spent plenty of time in, in crypt on Krypton. So uh Well, yes, of course you wrote the original World of Krypton miniseries. I'm assuming that's why right. David thought you might know. And I also um, wrote a Nightwing and Flamebird uh uh feature in, in Superman family for about a year. I love that feature, <laughs> man. Yep. Van Z and Akvar. That's right. The, uh, were the, uh, you know, as opposed to Superman and Jimmy, who were the original uh, right. Nightwing and Flamebird. No, I love that. Dude, massive fan of Superman family. I, I really loved all those stories. I would have bought the individual Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen uh, issues had they continued as, uh, you know. I single did when, when they ones. were, yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, pretty amazing, man. Um, no, I, I love that. And, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, this David is uh, saying – a different perspective or at least new layers on uh, the presentation and stuff. I, and yeah, Wayne says we need more of these. God, I wish they existed. I mean, thank God most conventions now are smart enough to film their, uh, their panels. Yeah. We've certainly been doing it at Terrificon and uh, I know the big shows are doing it and everything. And that's great because really uh, it's funny. Like um, I remember one of my first San Diego's was one of um uh, Alfred Drake's last 
uh, San Diego. And he interviewed Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Wow. Uh, Albert, Alfred, Alfred Drake, uh, Doom Patrol creator. Am I saying it right? Or is Arnold it uh, Drake. Arnold Drake. Thank you, man. See, yeah. there you go. There's my John Houston. All right, there we go. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that's true. David David pointed out that, uh, yeah, action number one was sure a bargain in 1988. Yeah, hadn't reached the six-figure uh, mark yet, according to Julie. Listen, I remember, uh, I remember back in 71, uh, there were Robert Bell. Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, um, Rogowski. Um, there, there was a dealer named Rogowski, and uh, we got his his uh, his list, you know, his sale list. And uh, Superman number one was like a hundred bucks. Wow. I mean, you know, like it might as well have been a hundred thousand. Sure. <laughs> you yeah. Know. Oh no, I hear you, man. Uh, but yeah. Um. Isn't it interesting, too, as Julie pointed out, that after uh, being on the cover of Action Number 1, he wasn't on the cover again for six issues. It, it was at Action yeah. 7. And well, I wonder sure. I wonder both how much Action 7 is worth and also those two through six issues of Action that don't have Superman on the cover and how many of those exist. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, uh, uh, you know, nobody, I, I don't, you don't hear much chatter about those about those books because they're, you know, but it, it was, you know, it, 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 it was, it showed that they had no clue what they had, you know, in Superman. I mean, that thing well, sold out the first issue and then, you know, they didn't know that in for six months. Right. Because that's how long it took sales to, uh, to uh, reports to be coming from around the country. Is, uh, I, I mean, and does your, that ledger that you had for so many years, does it reflect that, um, you know, span of six months of not knowing? Is it is it documented in that ledger too? Was it? Um, well, all those numbers, you know, the, these were final numbers, so these would be the numbers sure. that they had at six, you know, at the end of the um, uh, uh, of the period when the final sure. final numbers came in, you know, and those numbers, you know, you remember DC, all the co companies used to publish their sales figures. Uh, their their um, statement of ownership that had you know these estimated numbers in them, and yep. their you know their ballpark and a very large ballpark, um, you know they were they would throw everything, including complimentary copies and you know copies accidentally shredded uh, uh, into the you know into the sell through number. Um, so uh, it was interesting to see the the difference. It was usually. A few, you know, ten thousand or or higher difference in in the in those numbers than in 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 the few statement of ownership that I I checked out. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna zoom in on you, Paul, because uh, I think Brad wants to know if uh, the Superman phone is still valuable. He needs to Google that. And is that the is Superman that a Superman phone? phone? Yeah, is that a Superman? Is that bust behind you? Is that a Superman telephone? Oh no. This is a this is a uh, piggy bank. Oh, that's hilarious! <laughs> Fantastic, that's great, man. No, so, that's yes, that's wonderful. It's it's as valuable as all the change that's in it. <laughs> My sister uh, made us homemade uh, Christmas stockings uh, for the holiday, and uh, on mine she hung a Batman or a plastic Batman ornament, and I'm like, yeah, that's coming home with me. Because yeah. I have I have so few Christmas doc, uh, decorations in my place, and I'm like, oh no, I need uh, I, I I need that to go along with my Star Trek uh, Hallmark uh, ornament depicting the death of Spock. <laughs> Nothing says Christmas like Spock's Nothing death. Nothing says Christmas it's, like a dead Vulcan. Sure, it's sad but true. So yeah, <laughs> um, what other option? I mean, again, just the information on all those sci-fi pulp writers. God, his loving tribute to Alfred Bester was amazing. And I I had yeah. forgotten that he they want you know he wanted Alfred uh, to do the the Superman script instead of mm -hmm. Mario you know obviously Puzo I mean you know Puzo big name Puzo was going to write you know obviously did work at uh, Marvel's parent company and wrote a lot of pulp stories I don't, I don't, do you know if he if Puzo wrote comics Puzo never wrote comics he worked for the, for their slicks and for their men's magazines exactly um, yes uh, I yes. 
mainly wrote, you know, like men's, you know, like men's sweat adventure stories and things yeah. like that. Uh, oh, Puzo yeah. Puzo was not, you know, Puzo had this great, this great idea. And, and, you know, Godfather is a great story. It's a, of course, it's not a great novel, but it's a great story. Um, yep. and, and, you know, I give him all the credit for that, but, you know, his, he had a civilian's perception of comic books. Um, you know, uh, and, and when you hand over comic book characters to people who look at them as, you know, pow, bam, biff and, and, and kid stuff, um, they're going to come up with the stupid shit, like stealing a bottle of champagne from the queen of England. I mean, you know, nobody would have written that in a comic book story because it's like, well, first of all, you know, Superman wouldn't steal, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and, you know, of course, you know, Clark Kent could have bought the bottle of champagne before he took off his suit and went to Lois's, you know, so, but you know, the, his screenplay was ridiculous and, and just, you know, without any merit whatsoever. Uh, Bester would have been, Bester would have come up with some weird stuff because best, I mean, you know, if you've read stars, my dad, he tossed off more, you know, things in a chapter or a couple of paragraphs. You know, my, my, I, I introduced Bester to my son when he was about 15. Wow. And he said, anybody else would have written, you know, another book just on that chapter there is so much in there you know it's like and e even even a kid recognized that bester was just, just like you know so it would have been weird it, it would have been strange but man it would have been great you know no i'm with you and thank god tom mankowitz is the and, and donner kind of took the puzo yeah. thing and and did what they could with it yeah yeah i mean there's so. still a lot of ridiculous stuff in in, in Superman oh, yeah. the movie. you know like you know at the time it was brilliant because there had been nothing remotely like it ever before um yeah. so in that context you know you could overlook the silly shit um uh you know um a lot more than you can these days because it's it's it's, it's overwhelming <laughs> but no i'm with you man i'm with you um you know oh brad says that uh and forgive me because i stepped away for a moment and i've forgotten that um he was talking about in the video there's a valuable phone that sold for eight thousand dollars in 2015 on eBay. He just checked. So the witch that's did? that's the Superman phone he was referring to, and he did say that your piggy bank does look like the phone did as well. Oh, okay. So <laughs> very weird, man. Um, I'm trying to think of any other. You know, I I I certainly hope it sounds like Superman is only going to be kind of a side character in in upcoming DC films, if at all. Um, I thought it was yeah. a great mistake that they. I hope that they are able to make amends with Henry Cavill and bring him back because yeah. as much as I had my little quibbles with justice league and man of steel, um, Henry Cavill as an actor is perfectly cast. I, I, I mean, in the modern era, I can't think of a better man to play Superman right now. Yeah, no, I think he, I think he did a, he did a great job and I'd love, to, you know, on the one hand, I'd love to see a really good Superman movie, but since we're not going to get one, you know, <laughs> Let's just let them use him as a as as a side character instead of just you know coming up with another you know Superman versus Atomic Man. No, I hear you, man, and no, and I mean we'll see what happens with the Black Adam movie. There's rumors that Superman will be in the Black Adam movie, which I think is interesting. Um, we'll see. Yeah. But also, uh, I was going to say, and I and I ask you, Paul, because uh, you'll know the reference. Uh, people were throwing up various. Um, dream casts of dc heroes and uh the guy that i wish had done some sort of either superman tv series or film that never got to was clint walker cheyenne yeah i mean he yeah. was six foot six all muscle even yeah, when he was he sweating, would have like the spit curl and everything the spit curl he had, he had the jaw yeah no he would have been great he would have been a, a great superman yeah so yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, oh, well. Uh, there you go. Wayne says that, uh, yeah, Superman is the new Hulk in movies. Yeah, kind of the uh, kind of the guy to measure your power up against or whatever. We'll see what happens. Absolutely. Well, Paul, this was amazing. Yeah, I, you again, know, I, I, I try to keep my expectations very low. That way, 
you know, it doesn't break my heart again. <laughs> Dude, I hear you. I hear you. We can wrap up, Paul. I mean, but I know it's got little... Peacemaker. What's that? But at least I've got Peacemaker. So Hell yeah, man. Absolutely. <laughs> have we talked about um I don't think we have talked about that. Let's talk about that for a second. I don't think we've talked since uh, the squad movie came out. So yeah. what were your, you know, uh, you know, yeah, what'd you think? And what do you think of Cena? I I, I think Cena has got the perfect, like, you know, um, I, he's, yeah, I, I didn't write, he's, he's a lot thicker in, in this, uh, you know, in Suicide Squad and, 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 the, and the series, I assume, uh, than he was in the comic books. Um, you know, there's, there's a bit of a dunderhead, uh, character going on about him but um you know I, I thought if that is the if that's the interpretation you know this is the guy to do it he's <laughs> yeah he's uh, very funny. I, I, you know it looks like a lot of fun it's just um you know it, it's so over the top you know when i was when i wrote it you know this was like you know right in the middle of that the whole grim and gritty thing you know i was an early adapter of grim and gritty and vigilante sure. and and, and checkmate and, and, and this peacemaker thing. And, you know, you write that stuff, it, you go over the line. You're, you're just like, okay, this is no longer real. Uh, this is no longer, you know, we're not even pretending to be connected to reality anymore. This is just a total, you know, explosion of, of, of craziness. Um, and you can do anything in that. And, uh, you know, and it's kind of like the roadrunner you know, it's kind of like the Wiley Coyote running off the cliff. You know, keep yeah, going. But, you know. Yeah, but I'll tell you, man, reading those stories in the 80s, it was exciting to see a character that I remembered from the Charlton days being portrayed as unstable. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, yeah. And not used you know. to a guy that's supposed to be a hero really being this loose cannon and everything. And it was. I thought I thought it was very exciting your stories. I really did. I, you know, I I I don't know if I if I had the philosophy back then, but you know, fundamentally, all superheroes are unstable. I, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right, man. Well, and obviously, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons leaned into that with Watchmen and everything. Yeah, yeah. So. I, I you know, but you know, when I took over Vigilante, it was like, yes, this is this hero, and I go, you kidding? He's, he's he's insane. He's a judge who doesn't like the way things go, so he puts on a black costume and picks up a gun and kills people no were, <laughs> i mean and they are different characters uh but you know were you thinking i mean and i know it started with marv as well but were you thinking at all punisher with vigilante um uh well no um uh okay. punisher just seems to randomly kill <laughs> you know punisher always came to me as like if, if there's collateral damage Hey, what the hell, you know? Right, right. Or, um, and uh, I can write that kind of character. Uh, I could write a crazy man who still has a conscience, um, which ultimately yeah. led up to him, you know, blowing his, you know, taking his own life. Taking his own life, um, absolutely. Because he couldn't live with what he had become. Right. Um, you know, and you can continue a character like that when they reach that point and then it's just disturbing, you know, like you, sometimes you just got to like, you know, as they say, kill your darling and, uh, um, you know, <laughs> darling, you're done. Well, honestly, I, I love it because it got so dark and you were allowed back then to go there. Yeah. And I think you guys handled it in a very mature way. And I think the uh, postscript uh, where the letters would be, uh, your your comments there, I think, were very responsible, and uh, it's a shame because obviously, no way in hell you get to do that today. No way in hell. Oh no, no. At least I not mean, in DC and Marvel. Wade did irredeemable. That I believe ended it with him killing himself and everything. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I oh, mean, that's and, interesting. Yeah. I like I like Wayne's uh, comment here. Vigilante is the comic book version of remember the old film, The Star Chamber, where the justices, the judges. Yeah. Yeah. Went out and killed guys that got away with it and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, there Wayne, is some of that in there. Um, Wayne also wanted to know if uh, you've had a chance, if they showed you any, because I don't think it's on HBO Max yet, uh, no. the miniseries. Uh, oh, shit, it's uh, uh, Peacekeeper. 
But yeah, you haven't seen any previews or anything? No, I haven't seen I, I haven't seen anything you haven't seen. It's uh uh I, I have um uh James Gunn and I have have you know exchanged Twitters uh oh, nice. of uh fortunately mutual admiration. And <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and he has cited, you know, he cited me as and my my work and John Ostrander's work as being, you know, very much, you know, in 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 his mind in the creation of, of, of the whole mix there. So there's no uh, doubt. And I'm so glad because no disrespect to David Hayter the, of the uh, first film, but the second movie really did nail the Suicide Squad, gave it the right tone, uh, the right setting, everything. The yeah. right adversaries. Um, yeah, it really was. I, I love that movie. I, I mean, it really, to me, it's the best. It was the best superhero movie of the year. I, I will confess, I haven't seen Spider-Man yet. I will see it before yeah. I speak to film critic Matt Singer next week when we do our, our list of best TV and best film and everything. Um, but uh, yeah, any, any thoughts on any current or recent other uh, superhero product, Paul? I don't know what you've seen. Had the opportunity to see uh, um, Marvel or DC? Uh, I don't do Star Wars. Okay. Um, uh, I saw Boba Fett yesterday. I thought it was excellent. The first chapter, but go on. Oh, you see, I thought that was the Aaron Sorkin uh, Lucy movie, Baba Bo Baba Lou. <laughs> I, I I didn't know that was a Star Wars thing. I saw that too. I yeah. saw the Lucy and Desi movie. Yeah. I liked it. It was. It was okay. It was yeah, it was okay. It was, it was dark, and so I was disappointed. <laughs> well, I'll even say, and I agree with you, I kind of called it second-rate Sorkin. Yeah. But compared to everything else, second-rate Sorkin is good enough. Sure. Look, you know, I understand, you know, Sorkin is, is a very mannered writer. You know, you, you listen to actors who have worked with him, and they say, yeah, can you can you ad-lib? Can you change? No. 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 Sorkin Sorkin is a playwright. He comes from the Broadway stage. Where listen to this, people. Under contract, nobody is allowed to change a single word of your of your script without your consent. That's what a power. wild! That's fantastic. That be a beautiful place to live. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you, so, man. So um, yeah, so he's very strict about that. But um, Shang Chi, yeah, Black man. Widow. Did no, you, I, you know, I don't subscribe to any of those services, okay. so I haven't really seen anything. It's just like, you know, we pay enough for we, We've got to learn how to, um, you know, we, we got to break cable and start signing up for the individual services so we can get this stuff. But that's like complicated and, 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 and I'm old. No, I respect that. And also, um, I'm glad, uh, getting back to Peacekeeper, that they at the very least re-released a lot of your stories into that uh, collection. Well, just uh, just a vigilante story. They they haven't reprinted the the miniseries. Oh, I thought I don't think they're going to because I took a look at it again recently, and um, it's got some pretty insensitive shit in it. Oh, okay. Well, it's, it was a it's, different it's time. It's a lot of Arab terrorists. All right, I'm happy. Well, again, it was a different time, and I and it was I, a different time, and and you know, sure. I'm even like you know, looking at it, it's like, ooh, did I write that? <laughs> But, I'm hip. No, you know, I understand that. Was the that. Gestalt, I guess, but okay. You know, but so I don't think they're going to reprint that, and I don't know why they haven't reprinted the original Charlton stories, or even mentioned uh, Pat Boyette or Joe Bill, the true creators of Peacemaker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul wanted to know. If, say again. Say again, Paul. I said that's okay. a mystery. Why the why okay. why the original creators have not been credited on the film in publicity. And I mean, my names are in the, you know, are in the thank yous, but Pat Boyette and Joe Gill don't appear anywhere in the movie. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that happened. Uh, Paul, uh, Wayne wanted to know, will you be doing another Kickstarter soon? Another Kickstarter? Um, no, I've kind of, I, I, I hate Kickstarters. They're a pain in the, they're a pain in the ass and a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I am publishing, uh, I, I've got another book. Uh, it's out at my proofreader now. It's called, uh, the Devil and Leo Persky. It's a collection of uh, half a dozen short stories I've written about this uh, 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 reporter for the of the Supernatural who works for the Weekly World News, where I had once been an editor and a writer. 
but in his world, every word in the paper is true. Um, and uh, so I'm publishing those six stories. That's great. A, a new novella uh, wow. to, to round it out. So uh, again, that's at the proofreader. I'm hoping to have it out in the next uh, month, month and a half. And, um, you know, I just put it up there and, and hopefully, you know, instead of bothering with a whole Kickstarter thing, people just go to Amazon or, or contact me and get it that way. Uh, Brad wants you to know that uh, he's been rereading his uh, Archie the Married Life collection. Still loves what you did with the alternate worlds and paths for Archie's futures. I completely agree. That's when I started talking to Paul. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember back then saying... I'm like, Before that, he wanted nothing to do with me. He ignored me totally. But then suddenly, oh, a little spotlight on Paul. Let's have him on the show. <laughs> um, no, no, no. You know that's <laughs> not true. I know you're kidding around. I am. Um, but yeah, what else? What else are you selling right now? I mean, there is, of course, JSA Ragnarok, which I love, and I'm so glad you. that you put it back out there because it's great to read a tremendous Justice Society story with all my favorite present and classic uh, JSA members. I, I yeah. love that story. Well, that was originally written in 2005 uh, during that continuity during the whole. Jeff John's run, which was probably the best, you know, that, that, that series has ever seen. Um, and, uh, uh, so, you know, I had the advantage of that great team at the time. Plus, you know, it's a novel in, in, in those novels that the iBooks was publishing them, you know, you could do anything because it's yeah. not really, you're not tied to continuity. So you can just write your story without worrying that, you know, Batman is going to be in, Peru that month, um, you know, so um, it just opens it up. And and ever since I'm a kid, I was a kid and I read um, uh, 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 Captain America and the Great Gold Steel by Ted White and um, uh, Batman and the Fearsome Foursome uh, by, uh, uh, you know, by, by uh, William Woolfolk. Uh, what was the name they used on the books? I forget. Uh, there was forget too. another another name on the novels, but um you know, the for, Marvel novels, like, like been, Pasco and those guys wrote as well, right? The Mar the Marvel novels that were oh, written. Sure. Well, by that time, yes. I, some of them were very good, not counting the two I wrote, but <laughs> in that series. But um, uh, it, it just, it it was the first, and I'd been reading comic books for, you know, several years at that point. But suddenly it was like, you know, the, the, the prose form kind of brings the characters to life. You know, you can be inside their heads in a way you can't get in a comic book. Uh, you know, you tell a story differently in a novel. It's all about, it's more about the internal uh, than, 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 you get, than you do in a comic book. So sure. uh, I always loved writing, reading that format, you know, reading superheroes in prose. And, and um, you know, I was just trying to do do with the JSA what had made me happy in other books. So, I hear you, man. Uh, Wayne name checks, of course. Elliot Magan's Last Son of Krypton and, oh, and Miracle Monday. Great books. Absolutely. Those were, you know, I before I I re write, wrote the JSA novel back in the early two thousands. I reread those two books because I, I Elliot, those are two of the best, uh, 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 not you know, comic book novels that, that have ever been done agreed and elliot uh got the rights back to pub you know republish them yeah under his own banner and he's selling those right now yeah. and uh mention some of your other novels that are uh, out there uh paul that people can find at paul com. well uh yeah you can find you know you, uh, or go to amazon and 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 look for them there uh there's my uh paul kupperberg's illustrated guide to writing comics uh there's um uh gosh i have to look up on the shelf now yeah, exactly um, oh and, um yeah grab them by all means no that'd be great man here i'll, I'll zoom in and this is coming out in february from uh from uh uh, uh heliosphere press publications it's a uh it's a, a young adult uh uh a, a young reader novel about uh, a kid who who uh, wants to be a superhero so much that he wanders around town wearing a, a costume under his uh, clothes in case he has a secret origin. Um, and then he lives in this out of the way 
you know, can't get there from here town. And then a real retired uh, uh, superhero moves to town. And wow. Hilarity ensues. Fun. Um, oh, that's, yeah, so that's, an excuse. that's an excuse for us to talk in a couple of weeks. That'll be great. Yeah. Um, and also your direct current interviews that you did with so many great creators. Right. Direct comments, told- which was a, a compilation of, uh, of uh, two dozen interviews that I did in the, uh, around 1990 with uh, uh, creators for uh, uh, DC's direct current uh, 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 newsletter. Uh, so uh, I found a bunch of transcripts of the, of the complete interviews and I, I polished them up and heavily footnoted them. And, and uh, uh, because, you know, they're, they're events that happened, you know, 30 years ago and people talking about stuff that happened 50 years before that. So um, uh, it needed a lot of footnotes to explain. No, I understand things, but, uh, but it was a lot of fun. In fact, I, I'm, I'm going to get after the new year uh, when, things settle down a bit, I'm going to start uh, uh, in, uh, trying to interview uh, my peers, uh, Bronze Age creators who came in around the same time I did. That is and, great uh, to talk hear. to them about that era. You know, talk about what it was the industry so was gl- like in the yeah. 70s coming up. I'm so glad to hear that, Paul, because again, we need the record set straight. Yeah. And, like, and, and, and really... That's wonderful. You and you know, I, and and as I was making a list of people I wanted to interview, I would you know come up with a name and I go, well, shit, he's dead. You know, she's gone. Um, and and I figured if I got to do it now, while you know, certainly while I'm still here, let I'm alone here, a lot of these other guys. No, you're no, you're so right, man. And I and I wish you luck with that. That's terrific. And uh, again, I'm really glad that's happening. That's wonderful. And and forgive me. What's your 50s comics murder mystery? Oh, it's called The Same Old Story. Yes, it's a, it's a murder mystery set in the early 1950s in the comics industry. Mr. Schwartz uh, 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 turns up as a character in, in the story. I originally wrote him in as kind of a, you know, a, a, a cameo, as a tribute to, to an old friend. And, um, and then I found out that really I needed him in the story because once again, Schwartz, what direction should I take? Uh, so that's awesome. Yeah, same old story, everybody. Again, you can find all these books at paulcupperberg.com. Wayne wants to know if you're going to interview that youngster, Howie Chaken. Um, yeah, I'm going to try to. He's on the list. Um, uh, cool. again, you know, this is just, I, I want to, you know, it was such a fascinating time. You know, we were the industry was still pretty new. I mean, it was 40 years old in 1975, you know, and, and, and the guys who created it were still there, you know, they were in their sixties. They weren't, you know, and so they wandered through and we all met them and we all had stories about them, but let's get that, you know, let, let's get that shared experience together. Um hundred percent, man. No, I, and that is the great thing about that bronze age. And I've heard Paul Levitt say the same thing and Howard say the same thing that, you know, yeah, you had you had, again. I mean, you know, Alfred Rester was walking around, uh, you know, D.C. and stuff in the 70s and 80s. And yeah. The man I who mean, gave Green yeah. Lantern his, uh, his oath, you know, it that was, kind you of know, thing. and, you know, geez, uh, uh, you know, Kurt Schaffenberger and Kurt Swan and and, and Murphy Anderson and and uh, uh, Bill Drought, I mean, Bill Drought and, and Tex Blaze Dell. Text uh, plays down the office. They would yeah. sit at a couple of drawing boards at DC, and um, um, both gentlemen enjoyed a drink at lunch. <laughs> and right. the best time to catch them was after lunch. They would still be inking, but they were real loose and happy to talk. And so you know, you could just sit there and listen to to Tex Dell, who was everybody's assistant, on, you know, in newspaper strips over the years, um, tell stories and. And Bill Drought was just a sweetheart, you know. Um, uh, so it, it was just, um, you know, just it, it's a wonderful time. I was a kid in the candy store. And, and all these guys were, you know, were, 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 were walking through. About 10 years ago, I, tr- I uh, treated myself to my only Kurt Swan art page. Mm. And it was inked by Tex Blaisdell. Yeah. And it's just a, it's a Lois and Clark scene. Uh, it, I mean, there's, there's a kind of Superman kind of on a radar scope. That's right. the only Superman image on the page, 
but otherwise it's it's Lois and Clark. They're at the Capitol in the Capitol cafeteria eating the famous white bean soup that if you ever take the Capitol tour, that's what it's known for. And um, and they're commenting on it. And it's just a very cute scene. But I was I mean, as much as everybody wants a Swanderson, you know, uh, Swan and Murphy sure. Anderson page. I'm like, I'm very happy that I have a text plays Del page. Very that's happy. pretty cool. Yeah. And and you know that that bean soup thing, that was probably a a, a tribute to you know a, a little thing for Julie, who was a Yankee bean soup fiend. It was like every day for lunch, the bean soup. So that's awesome. So that may be what that was referring to. That's hilarious. That's fantastic. Oh man, <laughs> too goddamn funny. Um, Paul, well done as always. I love these Thank conversations. You. I appreciate you. Uh, answering the call whenever I whenever I do it. And in this case, you're the one who's like, hey, I got this amazing videotape. Can we do a word balloon? I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody that watched, thank you very much. Good questions. Yeah, thanks and, for being uh, Well done. Absolutely. Um, I think that's going to do it this week for Word Balloon Live. So everybody, including Paul, have a safe and prosperous new year. You too. Happy new safe. year, everybody. Absolutely. And I, I, everything going okay COVID-wise, Paul? You're staying safe and everything? Yeah, I'm triple vaxxed and feeling fine. <laughs> As am I, sir. Exactly. <laughs> Wait a minute. Don't do that. Don't even tease. No, no, no. Well, you got you got too much work to do, man. We need you here. That's right. You know? I've got the I'm, next book to write. 100%. Everybody, thanks a lot for watching. Stay safe. 